The 14 points, put in general terms, of having the peace founded in equality and self-determination was one of the sole factors that brought Germany to the bargaining table in 1919. Although this was the premise of the German surrender, the French and the British never gave any indication that Wilson's 14 points would be incorporated into the Peace Treaty in any form. The first being point two, which spoke of absolute freedom and navigation upon the seas. The British had been the world's main naval power for more than a century, and had no intention of relinquishing any of its claims or position, especially in a war that they had just won. In addition, the French also had no intention of allowing Germany to accept a place of equality, as they having suffered horrific damage at the hands of the Germans, fully intended to not have Germany on equal footing of any kind. Another way that the 14 points was not to be honored was a part of no secret programs or private international understandings. For secret treaties was how Britain was able to persuade both Italy and Romania into joining the Allies. The Allies were all in agreement that Germany should pay, yet the problem was exactly what Germany should pay, for what, and to whom. As was stated by Margaret Macmillan in her book Paris 1919, France had suffered the most damage, followed by Belgium. However, the British had invested the most money. In determine who should get what portion of German reparations, there was deadlock over the terms. France and Belgium were hoping to have their entire war debts paid by Germany, as well as pensions for the widows and orphans of soldiers. However, it was almost impossible to get accurate figures on what was actually due to them, as Belgium, for example, gave numbers that were greater than its pre-war value. President Wilson believed that Germany should only pay for damages caused by the actual fighting whereas Lloyd George believed that the lion's share should go to Britain, as she footed most of the war bill. The next part was determining German capacity to pay without destroying their economy. As Macmillan said, if the numbers were set too low, people would think that Germany got off too light and would recover too quickly. If too high, the German government could collapse and give way to the very real threat of Bolshevism taking over in Germany. In contrast, when looking at the disposition of Germany when she had been on the other side of the bargaining table, had not been known for its generosity. After the Napoleonic Wars, France had paid out, and Prussia had benefited. Same during the terms set for the French after the Franco-Prussian War, where France would wind up paying more heavily in 1871 than Germany would in 1919, as well as the recent German dealings with the Soviets at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and of Romania and the Treaty of Bucharest in 1918. Germany had demonstrated a willingness to completely cripple a defeated adversary. Now, they were on the receiving end and ironically fully expected fairness and equality. In time, the figure was set at 55 billion, which the number has changed significantly here and there over the years, which if Germany had consistently paid either way would have done so until 1976. The Germans were not even allowed a formal delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, but only a handful of representatives to attempt to negotiate terms of the treaty. When Germany was finally summoned to the Paris Peace Conference, they were brought in under guard and purposely having the train they were on slowed down while traveling to the most damaged places in France for dramatic effect, something that President Wilson refused to do when Clemenceau offered it to him, so his decision making would continue to be impartial. They were then taken to a hotel in Paris that was surrounded by French soldiers and barbed wire. Their luggage was dropped off unceremoniously on the floor of the lobby because no Frenchman would serve them. Germany had chosen Prussian Count Ulrich von brockdorf rantzau to lead the delegation and to negotiate terms. Arrogant and haughty, brockdorf rantzau entered the country telling a French official how it was believed that in his family that French King Louis XIV was an illegitimate child of one of his ancestors. Representing a defeated nation, brockdorf rantzau entered the peace conference by referring to whom many believed present to be France's greatest king as the Bastard Ransau, which only hurt Germany's dubious case of hoping for being treated honorably even further. The unrepentant position only served to further enrage the French and drive any feelings of empathy from the British and Americans. At the same time, French Prime Minister Jacques Clemenceau had the mammoth task of cooperating with Lloyd George Wilson and Orlando in the preparation of the peace conference, whilst fighting the tide of his own countrymen who all wanted Germany to be ground to powder. When the German delegation entered the conference, they were greeted with Clemenceau, also known as the Tiger, flatly saying, The hour has struck for the weighty settlement of our account, thus setting an unmistakable tone for the remaining portion of the conference. 
From this, the Germans quickly saw that this was not to be a, uh, any form of treaty making, as much as a dictation of terms, terms that they would have no choice but to accept. At one point, Brockdorf Ransau read an argumentative letter attempting to charge the Allies with causing the war and that they had forced Germany into the position that it was. The now furious Lloyd George snapped an ivory penknife in two, and Woodrow Wilson went to say, the Germans really are a stupid people. They always do the wrong thing. Thus further demonstrating that the choice of Count Brockdorf Ransau only served to do further injury to Germany's already precarious situation. The German army was to be reduced to 100,000 men and conscription to be done away with. And Alsace-Lorraine, taken by Imperial Germany from France in 1871, would be ceded back to France. The Allies then had the arduous task of sufficiently weakening but not destroying Germany. As was expected, Clemenceau was outspoken on this point, expressing that when he was a boy, he remembered there being several small German-speaking states of Pr Prussia, Saxony, Hanover, and so forth, basically suggesting that Germany be completely dismantled and returned to its pre-1870 state. This was dismissed outright, for notwithstanding the chaos that would have ended in Sudan's a result, it would have also made France once again the dominant power on the continent. Lloyd George also stated that he feared that the absence of a strong Germany would create a power vacuum in Central Europe. Among the reparations, one of key interests was when Germany began its retreat from northern France, they enacted a scorched earth policy, when they either transported back to Germany or destroyed all French manufacturing as well as destroyed all of the French coal mines. In the German border regions was a rich coal mining area of the Tsar, which was temporarily given over to French control as compensation. Clemenceau also pushed for a separate independent Rhine state to serve as a buffer to Germany. This was voted down as well of the Rhineland being demilitarized with most key points and bridges to be under French control. It was also decided to give Germany's eastern coal reserves of Silesia and eastern German border regions, including the major port city of Danzig, over to the new Polish state. Through this portion of the treaty, over 10% of Germans now found themselves living outside of Germany. Of the many terms dictated to the German delegation, the article that would cause the greatest outrage was the one to be known as the War Guilt Clause. As Article 231 read, quote, the Allied and Associated Governments affirm and Germany accepts responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all of the loss and damage to which the Allies and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjugated as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies." Close quote. Although the Allies did not intend it this way, as both Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire had similar clauses in their peace agreements, Germany took this as she was to accept full responsibility for the First World War which further added to the humiliation she was already experiencing. Brockdorf Ransau and the delegation spoke viciously against this clause. The Allies responded on June 16, 1919, by threatening that if the treaty was not signed within seven days, that they would do so by force. The German delegation was sent to translate and convey the Allied terms to the new Weimar Republic, who eventually agreed to the terms, as Germany was in the midst of a famine in which hundreds of thousands of people had died and hoped that with the signing of the peace that food shipments would be then begin to enter Germany again and feed the starving nation. President Wilson, in looking over the terms, went to say, if I were a German, I would not sign it. The Treaty of Versailles would be signed and the Great War would be declared over on June 28, 1919. It could be truly said that Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles at gunpoint. In only a few years, this would become a major tool in the hands of the Nazi party in building national resentment toward the Treaty of Versailles.